to tell you the truth, I just recorded another version of this and I had to stop it because I realized I was going on too long raving about 2001 A Space Odyssey. When I, I, want, I didn't want this video to be too long. Um, so, you know, <laughs> to, I guess the first one's 2001 A Space Odyssey. This is actually a, a corollary to the video I just made just about what I think about quality, of, what makes a movie good or what makes a movie worth seeing or whether or not we should aspire to authoritative descriptions of what we should be seeing and it's a very complicated and nuanced i think explanation of the topics which i did in the other video but i'm not going to go too much into it now i'm going to give some of my favorite movies uh one of them is 2001 in space odyssey which i saw for the very first time when i was maybe 14 or 15 and i fell asleep through it twice i, I was falling asleep on I, you know, it's a movie that is very slow and very quiet it's quiet, but also the sound design is very intense at times. But I saw it. I I'd watch movies after school, and when I whenever whenever I'd go home, I'd put the movie on and I just fall asleep. I you know I was just very ex exhausted from the day, and I couldn't get into it, and I was frust frustrated for a while. And then I saw it again last year. Uh, in a completely immersive environment, and it blew me away so much. It's it because of how perfectly it seems to encapsulate the human not just the human but the the life earthly experience of sorts it encapsulates everything in a way that i find i found so compelling and the music the music is so good the set design is so immersive and meticulously crafted and impressive and the visual design the visual effects are still up to date even if this film was made 50 years ago and some of it looks more realistic than you know sci-fi or cgi that comes out today so that's one of my films i'm gonna rank them. i'm not gonna rank them these are not ranked but these are alphabetical i'm gonna give my 20 favorite ones the next one is uh so 2001 a space odyssey by stanley kubrick um in from 1968 all right so the next one is this film called a brighter summer day it is a film by a director named edward yang who's a taiwanese film a taiwanese new wave film director who started making movies i think in the early 80s i think and then he I think this is his best film. It's called A Brighter Summer Day in 1991. It's kind of long. It's like a three and a half hour movie. A three and a half or four hour long movie. It's actually a four hour long movie. But it's about this young boy and his coming of age to some degree in the midst of 60s Taiwan. And I'm not sure if you're very familiar with Taiwanese, with Taiwan history. Probably not for most of you. But on Taiwan in the 60s was kind of politically turbulent to some degree. And there's a lot of gang culture going on. And this is a a boy who was growing up and during this tumultuous period of sorts for the youth and it tracks his progression and his falling in love with a girl and his friendships and all the things going on in his family it's a very it's a, it's long but it's so filled with emotion and heart and it's one of the few movies that i i've seen it three times or four three or four times now in the movie theaters and each of the times I've seen it in the theater, it has been... It was, each of those instances were some of the most enigmatic, the most wondrous experiences I've ever had in a, in the theater setting. Incredible movie. Next is another Taiwanese film from the same Taiwanese New Wave. It came out in 1989, and the film is called A City of Sadness. It's a film by Taiwanese New Wave director Ho Xiaoxian, who, if you're not familiar, with, if you're familiar with him, maybe you're might familiar with his most recent movie. It's I think it was his most popular one. It's called, The Assassin. Uh, it's like that was like a wuxia film that is kind of anti wuxia in its, uh, flow and stuff. But it's this movie called A City of Sadness, which is also about Taiwan. It is also about a very politically tumultuous, uh, tumultuous time in Taiwanese history, but this time in the forties, when. Uh, Japanese, the J Japan relinquished control of the country to China, and there's just this whole mingling of, of political wars and the families being torn apart and people getting imprisoned for supposed communistic tendencies and all this stuff, and the city, the a city of sadness in particular is about a family. It's essentially a family story. It's about a family growing up during this the forties and fifties. Uh, in the 40s, 40, around 1945 in particular, uh, and it is interesting historic in a historical perspective because you're you're kind of immersed in this in this environment. Same with the brighter summer day, you're like immersed into this 
environment that you don't normally see in other films and you're fully immersed in a way that uh and that lets you learn more about their culture learn learn more about the history learn more about what people do to get what they want to do and about intentions and motivations and the strength of the the unit of the family unit it's a very good movie and my favorite thing about Ho Xiao Shen is that his DP I forgot his name I think it's Mark Li Bing Bing um is it Mark Li Bing Bing I don't want to get this wrong um but his um cinema oh no it's not it's actually not it's Shen Huai and Mark Li Ping Bing is uh is a DP for some of his other movies I think he is a DP he's a he's a cinematographer of his films most of his films apparently just not for a city of sadness he's a, he's the one in Millennium Mambo he's the one in the Flowers of Shanghai Puppet Master anyway sorry for the mistake but uh incredibly incredibly looking film it's so the the colors are so visually emotive in a way that filmmakers just not not everyone is able to do and Ho Xiao Shan is a master of master of filmmaking and framing and all this stuff so I think that's a movie we're seeing my the third fourth one is something that is more recent and some of you may have seen it uh, but I personally resonated with it a lot and it was Boyhood by Richard Linklater in 2014 uh, that movie, I just the reason why I love it so much was not necessarily because of its. I guess you can't really separate wh- what it did formal formally, f- like the structurally with the one year it was filmed once a year and then it actually tracked the actual growing of of human beings and it, was, it felt it felt very anthropological in that sense. Although there was some kind of structure to some degree, or maybe you can argue some people argue think it's like a very unstructured and that's why people don't like it, or that it's about a privileged white kid and people don't like it for that. But I resonated with it very much and i think it was such a massive and um success in terms of experimental uh filmmaking not experimental in the sense of the event guard but experimental in production style and i think it it worked very well and i think there's something very moving about seeing someone literally grow up in front of your eyes and uh, the performances are so moving as well i i'm a big fan of boyhood uh, one, two, three, four, five. The fifth one is Day for Night from 1973. It is a film directed by Francois Truffaut. And it is a movie about movies. Many people love many people who love movies also love movies about movies. And I'm one of those people, unfortunately. Um, but it's about... Um, um, Truffaut kind of... It, it's a film about a director. It's a film about a director trying to direct a movie. And... All of the problems that go on in the production of the film, all the inter- all the internal like romantic entanglements, all the internal um, drama between the director and the film and the actors and the actors within the with the actors and the actors with their spouses who are not actors and it's hilarious. I think it's so funny, <laughs> it's so um, it's so cleverly made and it gives you kind of an in de- like an in depth look on. Uh, movie making the movie making process and the term day for night is when they shoot day scenes or I think it's when they shoot day scenes during nighttime or it's either or day for night I don't remember it's either when they shoot day scenes um, pretending it's nighttime or when it's nighttime they're showing show, shooting day scenes I forgot the sixth one is a film that I did talk about on this thing before I talked about this a uh, few couple of weeks or months back it's fanny and alexander it is a swedish film from 1982 by ingmar bergman it's one of the most uh romantic not romantic in a sense of romance but ro- it, it's just you know you when you watch it you'll know what i mean but it's very it's a romantic film i think it's a it's struck it's through the eyes of 10 year old alexander who is it's another um, family drama about um, twenty early twentieth uh, early twenty it's like twentieth century Sweden. It's like a family drama, seeing how they, uh, how their family blossoms and grows, and they're kind of this bourgeois family. But there are many internal dramas and conflicts. But I can't really summarize Fanny and Alexander, but it's an incredible movie. It's my favorite Bergman film, and I did talk about it on length at length before. So you can maybe just watch that review. Um, next film is called um, Oro Plata Mata, or it is called Gold Silver Death. It is a Filipino film from 1982 by director Peke Galiaga. And again, I guess I realize I do have a trend of this. You know, we all have 
biases and preferences, and I seem to really like um, picture um, films that are set in different time periods, you know, period pieces about families. This is another one of those. It's a period piece about Filip- a Filipino family in the Second World War trying to... They're an aristocratic family in the Second World War, maybe in the same level of aristocracy as perhaps Fanny and, and Alexander, but it's about an aristocratic family in the Second World War and their family dramas and how they're trying to deal with escaping the death from during the Second World War in the Philippines. Very, very visually uh, visually stunning film. I saw this in the theater as well. I've seen all of these. Well, I think I've seen all of these in the theater. Maybe I didn't see Day for Night, but did I? I'm not sure. I might have seen Day for Night in the theater. I don't remember, but I think I saw all of these movies I'm about to say right now in a movie theater, and that's probably one of the reasons why I enjoy them so much, because I saw them in the biggest of screens and all that. Next um, is The Human Condition 3, A Soldier's Prayer by Masaki Kobayashi from 1961. This is a Japanese film that I saw at Museum of the Moving Image at Queens in New York. And it is not, maybe it's not very popular, but it is a, the third of a trilogy of films. Again, it's like a period piece about uh, Japanese wartime soldiers who are trying to just survive and it's a it's you know stars the incredible Tatsuya Nakadai, and it has Ryu Chishu as in it as well. People who have been in films together and other film directors like Kurosawa films or Ozu films, but they are in this film and it's so it's such an ep- it's like the most epic um it's one of the most epic war films I've ever seen, and it's incredible and it's it sucks that most people don't know about it, but it's called the Human Condition. Uh, this is, it's a trilogy of films, and each film is like three hours long. It's kind of long, but I think it's 100% worth it, and it makes you reconsider the price of war and whether or not one, or the, the length at which one would uh, risk their lives for others or for themselves or what they would do. It's just like the title says, it's called The Human Condition. It's really just an incredible film. I'm saying, if it sounds like I'm saying similar things to all these things, it's, it, all these movies, it's not intentional. Uh, I just do think they're all incredible. <laughs> Obviously, they're my favorite films. Next, I don't know where number. I think we're in like a nine or something. It doesn't matter. Um, next is in the mood for love from two thousand, which I feel like is pro- maybe everyone knows this movie or not. So that's an exaggeration. But everyone who like is into film, really into film, knows this. It's probably what they're. It's unfortunately probably the only Hong Kong film they know, which is sad. But <laughs> it's it's a film by Wong Kar Wai from two thousand, and it's my favorite Wong Kar Wai film and. The reason why I love this film is probably because of when I saw it in my film academic life. Not academic life in terms of I didn't study film in school, but growing up, I saw this film at a very important time in my life when I was trying to figure out what made movies good or what, what I liked. I wanted to figure out more about myself and what I, what movies could aspire to possibly. And I saw this when I was quite young when I saw this, and I got blown away by... I don't even like saying this word because it's a very... I said it a while ago already, but it's just... Something about it that feels so perfect, <laughs> like uh, just in terms of the way that the story unfolds, the way that the characters are in relation, the the how their relationship with each other is presented in the film, how the de- characters develop throughout. These are not necessarily things that I think are the odds for all movies, but for this one in particular, it's just. Ah, oh, the, the, just the vividness of the colors, the reds. This is a movie that stays in my dreams, and I think about it often. And uh, there's not much to say about it. It's a, a, If anyone has seen it, they know the magic of this film. Maybe for some, they don't, don't like it as much. Maybe they prefer Chunky Express, or maybe something more obscure like, I don't know, Ashes of Time. But this is my favorite one car by film. Uh, and yeah, love that film. Next, this is going to be a long video, I'm sorry. Uh, next is Ivan's Childhood, which is a film from 1962. It's a film by Andrei Tarkovsky, who is his debut film. And I just loved the film's exploration of innocence. This is about a child during war. Again, I, I like a lot of these um, period pieces. I think they're all period pieces to some degree. Because In the Moon for Love is also a period piece of the 60s, but it was made in 2000. Uh, and Ivan's Childhood is a period piece about a child in the midst of war, again, and him... It's about the destruction of innocence to some degree, or not necessarily destruction, but how innocence is able to play within the structures of war. And it's very, 
it's kind of bleak, but also it's just, I love it so much. I, I haven't seen enough of Tarkovsky, but so far that's my favorite of his films. Next is Lawrence of Arabia from 62 as well, directed by David Lean. I saw this in the theater. I saw it on 70 mm. And, you know, I, I know Lawrence, I have heard of Lawrence of Arabia for so long, but I never wanted to see it because I felt that my expectations for it were too high. But I saw it as, I saw it as in 70. And wow, <laughs> I don't have much. This is another, it's another, um, it's about T.E. Lawrence in the First World War. It's an early 20th century period piece again. But there's so many parts of the film I'm watching and I'm just like thinking, how, like, how did they film any of this? How did they get all those people? How did they get all those camels? How did they f- get these shots? Uh, it's pure, pure, pure magic. Wow, I don't even have anything to say about this one, but this is something that I had such extremely high expectations for, and it managed to exceed those extremely unreachable expectations. Next is Los Olvidados by Luis Buñuel from 1950. It is a Mexican... Luis Buñuel... Did I talk about who... Sorry, I might have been skipping some stuff. Wong Kar Wai, Hong Kong film director. Andrei Tarkovsky, Russian film director. David Lean is from the UK, I think. Then, so Los Olvidados is, is by Luis Buñuel, who is a... He's famous for his sur- surrealism. He makes a lot of these aristocrat um, satires, like uh, The Discreet Charm of the Bourgeoisie or The Exterminating Angel. But my favorite of his films is Los Olvidados, which I think might be his first film or one of his first films. It's another one about childhood. It's about these um, delinquents who live in Mexico and about, again, the, the destruction of innocence. Very similar... Not, it's not similar uh, in terms of um, it's not similar in terms of what happens in the film with Ivan's childhood, but thematically it it can be in line with it, but not but in different ways. But you know, it's another one of my favorite films, Los Olvidados, a uh, Mexican film. Uh, there's also a, one, a serial sequence in it, but it's not as serial as the other films. I'm almost done. There's uh, 1957 Piazza by Guru Dutt. This is an Indian filmmaker. I think this movie was hin- Hindi, I think. And it is... It is a... It is a Bollywood... I don't know if it's Bollywood, but it's a musical to some degree. It's called Piazza. P-Y-A-A-S-A. And this is a film I had no expectations with going into it. And I came out of it, you know, almost in tears. I think it's one of the most... Moving... And heartbreaking tales that I've ever been able to watch. And it's about a destitute poet who searches for his true love while waiting to get his poetry published. And uh, who? this one is one of the more obscure ones here. Not obscure in the... Not, I don't know if it's obscure, but it's one of the le- lesser known ones here. But Guru Dutt apparently is a very great Indian filmmaker who is one of the most influential ones there. And he's not as popular in the West, unfortunately, but... This film is so good. Um, next is 2001. Um, in 2001, uh, Spirited Away, Spirited Away by Hayao Miyazaki, Japanese filmmaker, one of the pioneers of Studio Ghibli. Everyone knows him, and everyone's probably seen this film. And it is there's a reason why it's one of the greatest films of all time. For me personally, I don't again. I, I, I shouldn't be saying greatest films of all time, um, but it is one of the most beloved films of all time, perhaps. And it's just the way it treats. And explores the imagination and mythology, I think, and family and love. There's so many themes in it that it that it weaves together so wondrously, and then just the visual presentation of it, it's so mind blowing. And I love Miyazaki. I love all his films, but it's Spirited Away, even with all its hype and you know thing around it, it's it's in a class of its own. Next, I want, I don't want to talk too much about. I have, I don't want to talk too much about this next one. I, I have a whole review about it. It's. Ran by Akira Kurosawa. I want to hear my thoughts on it. There's a I talk about it in some other review. Nineteen eighty five, a Japanese filmmaker. This is another period piece. Uh, again about a family during war. Next is, The Searchers from nineteen fifty six by John Ford. This is. Another movie that I took a long time to watch because I thought that the expectations for it were too high. I saw it in a theater and I think it's one of the best movies I've ever seen. Within my, per- you know, it's weird because it's you know whatever my whatever my biases are, whatever my perceptions of film law is, when I saw the searches, I knew that it was 
special. There's something magical about the searchers, something universal about it that cannot be denied, and it's just so aesthetically pleasing as well. John Ford is such a great director, and I haven't seen enough of his films. Next is Abbas Kiarostami's Through the Olive Trees from 94. It is the third of a trilogy of films that started with Where's My Friend's House, and the, Where's the, My Friend's House, or Where's the Friend's House, and Life and Nothing More. It is this weird met meta, it's like a meta, it's a very meta film in which it's like, the, the trilogy is very trippy in terms of its structure, but essentially the movie itself is about the relationship between two actors on the set of a, f of a film. Yeah, that's, that's what, it's about the relationship between two actors on a set of a film. And the film that they're shooting is actually the prequel of this film, Life and Nothing More. And it, that's hard to understand. Just read what the film is about. And I think this is one of the most unique films I've ever seen. And Abbas Kiarostami is one of my favorite film directors. And I, it sucks that he passed away recently. Next is Tokyo Story from 1953. Uh, it, it tops the sight and sound list for a reason. And uh, I saw this before I knew anything about that list. But I saw this... When I was fifteen, and it's one of the first, one of the movies that really put me in tears. I was crying after the film. I was crying during the film. I was crying after the film, and it's one of the films that. It, it uh, that has genuinely, I could say, influenced how I thought about the world, how I thought about family, how I thought about love, how I thought about. Just, filial relationships and what it ought to be, what it should, what it can be what it might be what I want to do with my own family and how I want to approach living and talk your story if any movie can do that for you then I think it's worth watching or it's worth recommending two more movies next is oh, I guess yeah Yasujiro Ozu is a Japanese director um Abes Kirsami is a, an Iranian director yeah Next is um, Alfred Hitchcock. He's a British director who moved to the U.S. to make most, most of his popular films. But this film is Vertigo. Uh, this is more of a personal reason. This is more of a personal reason why I like this one. I mean, they're all personal and to different degrees. But I had an experience of watching this in a theater when I was in New York. And I, I had a very nice, amazing conversation with friends about it. And we talked about it for a very long time. And it it, it really opened up the everything that the movie seemed to be. I just I, I learned so much about film from that one night. Everything I learned so much about the purpose not purpose, but the, the possibilities of film. I learned so much about it in just one night from a conversation about the film Vertigo. So that is why I am putting on, on this list. It's also just incredibly it's an incredibly moving love story as well. I think it's so much a love story more than anything else. And last of all, twenty number 20 is The World of Apu by Satyajit Ray, an Indian filmmaker. From This film came out in 1959. It is the third film of a trilogy. Um, so this is the third, <laughs> third film of the trilogy I have. But it is a trilogy of um, the, um, it's a trilogy of films uh, called the Apu Trilogy. There's Pather Panchali, Apavajito, and Apur Sansar. It's also translated for some as the world of Apu, and it is again. It is a sto it's a story about growing up. It is a story that about a child. Well, if you look at it as as the trilogy of sorts, it's about a child from India, from a poor family who manages to. It's about his coming of age and becoming an adult, and the three movies track his development, with different actors playing him in different parts of his life and. It is about it's just like it's kind of like imagine boyhood, but then it's Indian, and then it but it, and it is from a poor family. I don't know, whatever. It's hard to explain, but again, it's about family. It's about love. It's about desire. It's about accomplishing your dreams. It's about the purpose of life and the wonders of life and what one ought, what one wants to be doing in their life and how they. It's about love and relationships and becoming, finding the one for you and all this stuff incredibly packaged in this beautifully, beautifully, look, beautiful looking film. Um, amazing performances, amazing directing, everything. Um, and that's the 20th film here. I mean, it's, I have there are many, I can talk about this for hours and hours, but uh, these are 20 of my favorite films and 
if this video is able to make any of you interested in any of them and you maybe want to watch any of them, um, I, I, that would be make everything worth it. But this is incredible. These 20 films, I think, it ch they more or less change how I think about film and change my life in very different um, areas. But, you know, check these films out for sure.